It's the time of year where we like to sit down with the chairperson of the Alachua County Commission and discuss the state of the county. And today we're very pleased to be talking with Chairman Rodney J. Long. Uh, welcome, Commissioner Long. My pleasure to be here, Mark. Uh, Mr. Chair, why don't, why don't we start by just uh, asking the general question, what is the state of the county? Well, right now I think the state of the county is one of uncertainty mainly because we're not real sure of what may happen in the future with the legislature. Uh, it appears, at least over the last year or so, that municipal government, counties and cities, have somewhat been under attack by the legislature. And it appears to be a power shift where decisions are no longer being made locally, they're being made in Tallahassee. And with that, when you start shifting how local governments uh, provide revenues and how they provide services with those revenues, it's a shift. And with that shift, we're, we're having to start doing more with less. And because of that, the county is real uncertain, not just the counties, the municipalities as well, uh, are very uncertain as to what the future holds. Now, um, just to give folks that maybe are not familiar with this, although <coughs> I don't quite see how you could not be, all the uh, attention it's gotten. Back in June, the legislature passed House Bill 1B, and I know that that was quite challenging for the county. Well, House Bill 1B uh, resulted in counties throughout the entire um, state to roll back property taxes, not just counties, but municipalities and other taxing districts like the library and special districts. And, and by doing that, there was about a $2.3 billion rollback. Of the $2.53 billion, $2 billion, we had about $1.53 billion in county revenue rollback. So, and that's in this current fiscal year that, that we were in. In addition to that, we're looking at the possibility of having an additional $1.5 billion rollback in the future if the January 29th Constitution Amendment passes, which means it could be a reduction, a continued reduction in Alachua County of an additional $8.3 million. Now, what that means for local government is, one, there may be some provision of services that may be reduced or eliminated. But I guess the problem that most of us have around the state is politics and government is local. We're the ones who are in a better position based upon we're closest to the electorate to determine what services they want. They can come here at any given time. Uh, they can talk to local government. They can pick up the phone. They can call us. We're here. They can come. And uh, if they don't like what we do, they can always vote us out. But when you're in Tallahassee making decisions thousands and miles away, uh, from your constituency, uh, you're making decisions that impact local government. When you begin to start rolling back property taxes on one hand, then you give unfunded mandates on the other hand. What you're doing is you're deciding for local government what's important to the people uh, that you serve. Uh, we've had a mandate just this past year where counties throughout the state have to provide uh, office space and technical uh, support for the regional conflict councils, which was created by the legislature to resolve what I don't believe was a problem and many people throughout the state didn't believe was a problem. And that is how you deal with conflict when you have two co-defendants in the court system who have a conflict. Uh, the old system was you would have a private attorney uh, who wanted to be a conflict attorney and the state would contract them out and the counties would pay for it. Uh, now you have created another layer of bureaucracy, if you will, and the county taxpayers are left to pay for that. That's an unfunded mandate. But on the other hand, you tell us you want us to roll back our property taxes and you increase our school board local required effort. Uh, by the way, the school board property taxes are used as the highest line item on everybody's tax bill, but you want us to roll back property taxes. You go take the credit for rolling back property taxes, two point some billion dollars, but at the same time you're passing on to the local constituency a higher tax increase. So the state legislature has been having it both ways. 
Now, <clears throat> one thing that I find complicated about this, and as I listen to you and the Commission uh, discuss this, is you're not saying, it doesn't sound like to me, that you disagree that the tax structure needs adjusting in the state of Florida. Um, I know there are some things that the Florida Association of Counties that you play a major role in uh, <clears throat> have discussed that they like about what's on the ballot and other things that they are uh, concerned about. Uh, but as you mentioned earlier, the main concern is that kind of erosion of home rule. But uh, what is the Florida Association of Counties uh, take on this and, uh, and how do you feel in general about tax reduction? Well, I think that <clears throat> the property tax structure in the state of Florida should be equitable. Uh, and the way it is now, it is not. Uh, you're asking the same people to give more. The, you have shifted the burden on taxes in the state of Florida from homeowners to um, property business, non-homesteaded property, renters, for example, and commercial property. So you haven't actually leveled the playing field, you just shifted the burden. And oftentimes with the uh, homestead exemption, the, the, the average, the maximum, if you will, that a person's homestead property can increase per year is 3%. So the Florida Association of Counties, we supported doubling the homestead exemption. Uh, and we also supported the 10% cap on how much a person's property taxes, non-homestead property taxes can increase. We also supported the additional 25,000 personal uh, property taxes, tangible taxes for commercial businesses as well. But you still haven't fixed the fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem is that of homestead property. And people take the portability piece, if you will, they'll be able to move from one location to another. We don't know what the impact of portability would be and neither do we know whether or not it's even constitutional. But what I can tell you is the tax structure is not equitable and we're going to continue to see year after year session after session more proposals to try to make it equitable so until we sit down and talk about the tax structure just in, in general uh, we're going to have these problems now senator former senate president john mckay and to his credit is beginning to look at some of the loophole exemptions currently now uh, we have if we were to begin to start looking at those exemptions uh, that we have in the state of Florida, that will begin to start leveling the playing field, uh, if you will. So there are many things that I think that we can do. I support property tax relief. Uh, the county supported, Florida Association of Counties supported, but it has to be equitable, and right now it is not. It is uh, a complicated issue for the average citizen to understand, but uh, the commission at their retreat recently uh, instructed the county manager's office to to kind of come up with a campaign that, that uh, educates both the pros and the cons of this issue. So that's something that, uh, with the Commission's guidance, we'll be putting out soon. Well, if, if in fact the January 29th Constitution Amendment were to pass, the average homeowner will probably receive a savings roughly in the neighborhood of $240 per year. And I guess the question one would need to ask themselves as they begin to consider the January 29th constitutional amendment is, if I were to save $240, what, at what cost would I save it? Would it be at the cost of the possibility of reducing public safety? Uh, would it be at the cost of eliminating services to the least fortunate of our community, our seniors uh, and, and elderly and others? Uh, what actually would it mean? Would it mean a reduced level of service when it comes to animal service or what have you? So I think we need to look at it uh, from that standpoint. Today, I couldn't tell anyone exactly what the county would do. We're still taking those things under advisement as to what would happen if, in fact, the Constitution Amendment passes on January 29th. But I think the voters need to make that decision, and it needs to be an informed decision, and it really ones that deals, one, with the pocketbook. Is $240 on average well enough for me to have? And if I do that, what happens to our le level of service delivery uh, throughout the entire um, state of Florida? Now, mind you, it would, it, it would impact several taxing districts here in Alachua County. Uh, you do know we have a special district for the, for the sheriff, for law enforcement, and we have one for fire. We also have the library district, which is a special district. So all of those particular districts will be impacted. What that means is there could possibly be a reduction of level of service with those three new taxing districts as well. Commissioner Long, uh, let's shift gears here a little bit. Um, 
I, I know one of the things that have been, has been of particular interest to you in your time on the Commission has been economic development. And one of the main components of economic development has been Plan East Gainesville, that uh, you have certainly been a champion of that uh, over the years. Uh, tell me where Plan East Gainesville is and, uh, and what the status of that is. Well, we're in the implementation phase of Plan East Gainesville. Uh, and, and before I address that, let me tell you what we've done to date. Uh, both the city and the county has adopted the Plan East Gainesville document, which is a document that was approved by many of the stakeholders in the process through Charette's over about a year and a half, starting from, like, from 2003. And the city and the county has adopted that document as a part of its comprehensive plan. So it is a special plan within both the city and the county. Now that in itself is historic. Uh, we've also been taking a little bit of bites moving toward implementation. Uh, right now the city is in the process of looking at the land use change which will change the current existing fairgrounds to a more of a commercial use, which was the number one recommendation in Plan East Gainesville to make the current existing fairgrounds, which is roughly 100 and some acres, a commercial park. In order to do that, the county had to take some steps. Uh, and some of the steps we've taken is one, we've worked with the state of Florida and we have successfully uh, accomplished changing the deed restriction off of that property, which could allow us now to move forward with a different use and we've placed that deed restriction on some other property we purchased north of the Levita Brown uh, waste transfer station, which is called the, White, the Weissman Track, which we're gonna have at some point in time a future, what I call Metroplex, which will not only include the fairgrounds, but a multi-purpose facility, which could be this community civic center that will be able to do things like rodeo, car shows, concerts, and, and things of that nature, have a 5,000 seat facility, and be able to, in addition to that, have about 500,000 square feet of industrial type use, which is a shortage of uses that we have in this county. So those are implementation steps uh, that we've taken. The other implementation step we've taken is we've worked with the city of Gainesville and the University of Florida with a joint participation agreement and we're doing what's called a Waldo Road Corridor study, which is going to be implementing those things on the Waldo Road Corridor, which relates to Plan East Gainesville. Uh, Professor Martin Gold from the University of Florida is leading that effort and the city and the county of the University of Florida have joined collectively together and we have many stakeholders, many from East Gainesville, but many of them business community leaders and others looking at ways to implement Plan East Gainesville. So we're in the implementation phase. Walmart is actually just a beginning piece and it could be an anchor on one part of the Waldo Road corridor uh, for the beginning of the Renaissance. Uh, it's not a cure-all. Uh, it's just a beginning. Uh, and there are other different developments that will be coming online in the future. Uh, the Hatcher Creek development, if we can ever get it to where it will be able to provide some of the commercial and retail uh, amenities as well as upscale housing will be a, a certainly a, a, a big piece for the Waldo Road Corridor as well as East Gainesville. Uh, there are some other different things that are going on in East Gainesville. There are other developers that we're talking with who are looking at not only providing housing but commercial. And the county right now, uh, next month, will be looking at the activity center uh, in East Gainesville, the one that, that we have, and looking at maybe changing some of the land uses there to move forward with that. So East Gainesville right now is in the implementation phase. Uh, the East Gainesville time has come. It's, it's, it's our time, as they say, in East Gainesville. And with the help of the city and the county and many of the stakeholders, East Gainesville will certainly be a viable place to live, certainly within the next five years. Now, <clears throat> going back to the uh, fairgrounds that you mentioned, uh, we were fortunate in that we had some funding mechanisms available through our uh, Visitor and Convention right. Bureau. Can you tell us about that? Well, the county decided that they're going to take the additional one cent for the bed tax that we normally would get and we would decide to spend it other different types of ways. We're going to use that as a part of our economic development effort to actually bring to fruition uh, the proposed Metroplex, which is um, the what we call a metroplex, we haven't really given it a name, but I call it that because it's going to have multiple uses. Uh, but that will be a, a revenue stream that we'll be able to use to actually start moving forward with that particular development. We're currently now doing all of the market analysis and those types of things to make sure that one that, and we got to have a business plan to make sure it works, to make sure that it is a viable plan and what we're looking at getting ready to do there is viable. 
Uh, the county should always be one, I believe, that should facilitate economic development. We should make sure that the infrastructure is in place, including spec buildings and those types of things. So when businesses come to our community, we have what it needs in order for them to locate in our community. And not only that, to make sure that they're in an area where they can get things like tax incentives if they're in the enterprise zone, as well as other incentives if they're in the CRA or the community reinvestment area. So they'll get other benefits in order to make that work so it's more of a private-public partnership. And the city of Gainesville is certainly going to be a major, major player in the development of East Gainesville because the majority of the land is in the city limits of Gainesville. Now, speaking of the future of development and plan East Gainesville and development in that area, one of your other projects that I've seen you champion over the years has been the Entrepreneurial Charter School. And can you, can you tell us how that's progressing? Well, we're at the point now of beginning the application process and doing all the due diligence for that, the 501c3 and those things, putting together the infrastructure for the Entrepreneur Charter School. And, and it is a partnership between the city, the school board, and the county, where the, the county and the city will each provide $100,000 for a future trust fund that will kids, when they graduate from the charter school, and then they matriculate to do four additional years, either through working in their respective profession or go to college can come back and get a 10% uh, match to go along with the SBA loan that they would have to be able to do a business plan for while in school and they will come back and we would the trust fund will serve as the matching fund and the beauty of that would be once they actually start their own business instead of paying the money back in the trust fund they will then hire a kid uh, in, maybe in the school or somewhere and they will mentor them and we will give them reduced uh, payment back for that and if they do it for four years they won't have to pay the money back so you're reaching back and helping others and we have to realize that not everybody's going to college but we got to try to find ways by which we can make sure that everyone in this community who wants to be able to stay here in this community can stay in this community and be able to provide not only a, a life for themselves a good quality of life for themselves but also become a taxpayer instead of a tax taker so that is the real goal of the Entrepreneur Charter School and and I would say by the year 2009 the school year 2009 we hope to have it approved before then through the school board and through the state. Mr. Chair the the concept of poverty reduction has really been this commission's number one priority certainly for as long as I've I've been here uh, and I think that's kind of been reaffirmed at uh, recent retreats and meetings. Um, Tell me about the, the, the state of poverty reduction efforts in Alachua County, and, and maybe we can kind of tie this into the 10-year uh, plan to end homelessness, too. Well, poverty comes in all forms and all fashions, and I think you have to attack poverty from every perspective, economically, uh, working through trying to train people to become entrepreneurs and making sure they have good trades if they're not going to college is one way to deal with it. Uh, providing workforce of affordable housing uh, is one way that you can begin to help do it. Uh, and the other thing is trying to make sure for those who've already fallen through the cracks to make sure that they have the necessary things that they can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And then addressing the most vulnerable of our citizens, our disabled and our senior citizens, making sure that they have adequate health care and the things that they need. All of those things combined help us to move people from poverty. So there, there are several phases that we're working on. Uh, you, we just talked about the economic development piece, uh, the homeless piece. Homelessness in Alachua County has been on the, on the decline. Last year, I think there was a 20% reduction from the previous year point in time survey of our homeless population. Now that could be many factors, but whatever the factors are, there is a reduction in our homeless population. Uh, the city and the county, to its credit, has really become a leader now, not only in the state, but in the country, and moving forward progressively in dealing with our homeless population. Uh, next May, we should be bringing online in the city of Gainesville, to their credit, uh, the One Stop Center, which is going to be called the Grace Marketplace, where you can go take one stop, and our homeless population can be able to do all the things they need to do, all, see all the service, service agencies they need to see, apply for a job, uh, working through Florida Works. We just funded some money through Florida Works so we can begin to start hiring uh, the homeless community. Uh, and also they can be able to do all the things they need to do to be able to get on track. But in order to deal with the homeless people, we got to find ways to deal with housing because that's the main issue. One of the things that I'm looking at as a part of an overall uh, look at how we deal with affordable housing and workforce housing is 
the possibility of having an additional some additional cents placed on a documentary stamp tax uh, similar to the Miami-Dade and Hillsborough County and others to where this community would get together and decide how best we want to deal with housing and work with housing. Right now the market is, 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 is in real bad shape. There are houses that are out there on the market but still many houses on the market are still out of reach and out of touch with many people. Uh, many people can pay $600, $800, $900 for rent but for some reason, they can't get what they need to have to get to the next level. A lot of it has to do with credit issues. So, I mean, we need to look at that particular um, piece of housing. That's one of the, the issues that when we have the symposium this spring that we'll be looking at. Also, uh, our elderly population. We need to start looking at housing for our elderly population. Uh, and we need to start looking at also rental housing uh, for our community. Because whenever you have a shortage of rental housing, uh, not all housing, and I'm not speaking necessarily of subsidized housing. I think we can always deal with the subsidized housing, but I'm talking about market rate housing, rent housing. So that's the step. You go from rental housing, affordable housing, then you continue to, to progress. But I think those are the kinds of things that you deal with poverty reduction. So it's not just one particular component. You have to try to address, try to address it holistically. I think the county and the city has been doing a pretty good job of that. Chair Long, uh, I, I know that you're going to be going on a fact-finding mission down to Miami. Can you tell me a little bit more about this revenue source? Uh, you mentioned it is tied to dock stamps, and is that something that's generating revenues to help with the programs you're talking about? Well, it could be. If, in fact, the citizens of this community uh, decide that we want to have an additional few cents on a separate uh, dock stamp issue, uh, the, only the legislature can approve that and it have to be done through a special act. But before we even get there, I got to make sure that I understand how the programs throughout the state are working. I've had the opportunity to speak with Martin Fine. Martin Fine created the first uh, program back in 1983 uh, with the help of Senator Car then Senator Kerry Meek out of Miami. They were the first county to have a dock stamp program, which is in addition to the dock stamps that you charge on regular real estate transactions. Uh, this is above that, and that money is dedicated for affordable housing, workforce housing, rental, and, and the likes. It does not pay any subsidies for rent, but it allows people to transition to, to build additional rental housing, and also first-time home buyers, and also home buyers who are trying to, to move uh, up. So it's a, it's a very creative program that Martin Fine has put together. I've had conversations with him about that. The person who brought me this idea is, is Phil Emmer. Phil Emmer has been, you know, no one else to say what Phil Emmer has done for affordable housing in this community since the 1960s. It was a concept that he had and he wanted me to look into and I kind of took the ball and been running with it since that point in time. But there are several counties throughout the state that has this, Hillsborough County, uh, Miami-Dade, and I think Monroe County are the only counties to date that have it. So I'm going to Miami uh, in February uh, on a fact-finding mission. I'll get the opportunity to spend some time with Martin Fine and also uh, with Pat Brannon, who's the executive director of the Miami-Dade uh, Affordable Housing Program, where she administers the dock stamp and the other programs on behalf of Miami-Dade. So I'll get the opportunity to look at that model. Uh, I'll be visiting Hillsborough County to look at their model to see just how it works and to see whether or not there's something we want to emulate here. I'll be having a symposium sometime this spring where we'll be inviting in all the housing providers people in the market, realtors, builders, lenders, not-for-profit agencies, government officials to sit down and discuss this concept. I'll be bringing Martin Fine up to discuss his model, uh, the legislative piece. I'll be bringing up the executive directors from the other models to do their piece maybe in that morning. Then we'll have a breakout session with all of the community in, in terms of a charrette to talk about one, is this something we should do? And if so, how should we do it? What should the needs be? and how should the program be modeled, and then do some breakouts like we did, similar to when I put together the homeless charrette years ago, to where we eventually came up with a 10-year plan. Right. My goal is to have a plan that we can address with housing. Uh, it may end up being that if we get the funding source, we'll probably be able to help small cities do a better job. The current city of Gaines will do more. But it can be used for rehab housing. It could be used for affordable housing. It could be used to build rental housing. Whatever our housing needs are, we should be able to look at what our housing needs are here locally and be able to hopefully have a revenue stream that would help us move our housing needs. The other issue I believe it could do is begin to start helping us with inclusionary housing. 
and inclusionary housing is where you want to try to ensure that, that there are market rate houses that's probably below the market rate where people can buy houses in upscale housing subdivisions. One of the good things about that is it begins to diversify your neighborhood so you don't have what we're currently experiencing now with the school board having to go through rezonings because you don't have a real mixture in your communities. Communities should be reflected. And currently right now, if you look at where we are now in our elementary schools, we have neighborhood schools. Well, what that causes is it causes the people with similar socioeconomics to always be together. You don't have that intermingling and you don't have that interreaction until you probably get to the middle school. And what, what that would allow, if we can probably work out a program where we can work with the building community to try to help them work with them with a funding source to provide that type of housing, we can begin to see our neighborhoods become more diverse. And I think by having that, then we can have, a, as long as we have a diverse community everywhere, socioeconomically, we don't have to worry about these issues we're currently experiencing right now with the school board. Mr. Chair, I know another major component of the anti-poverty uh, effort that's going on in the commission is the CAP program, <coughs> um, CAP standing for Community Agency Partnership Program. And I know at, a recent, at the recent retreat that you all held, uh, you, you kind of recommitted to the CAP program even in light of what's happening in Tallahassee. I think last year there was some debate about what was going to happen to CAP funding, but uh, tell us a little bit about the importance of the CAP programs and what, what you all committed to at the retreat. Well, county government's main mission is to provide countywide rural services and social services. That's really the mission of county government. And if the county was not doing some of the things that many of these social service agencies are doing, you know, if they weren't doing it, we'll be doing it. So it's, it's, it, we, I believe, and, and, and the majority of us believe, actually all of us believe, that we can get a bigger bang for the buck by providing those dollars to social service agencies by way of an interlocal agreement, but holding them accountable in terms of the deliverables they need to provide to us and making sure that we get a bang for the buck in terms of the service delivery. Uh, and often, and it's a whole array of different types of services that are offered, uh, but it goes to poverty reduction. Uh, we try to fund those social service agencies we believe that helps the county in its mission of poverty reduction. So we can't continue to roll back dollars from those agencies. We need to try to make sure we can help those agencies. Some of those agencies use our dollars for matching dollars, state and federal dollars, and some of them get 10 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1 match by us providing those dollars. The community action agency comes to mind in terms of its leveraging. So we need to make sure that we're careful and how we send a signal. And that's not the signal that I think the county needs to send that we're rolling back and we're no longer going to begin to assist and help those agencies that are helping us do our mission. So we really, we recommitted to that again. So should the January 29th <coughs> ballot issue pass and that results in some sort of percentage of rollback, uh, the CAP funds would just participate in that rollback percentage? Is well, that we haven't really had a discussion, but I think probably what we'll do, uh, and, and here again, I, I can't speak on behalf of the entire board because we haven't made the decision. But if in fact there's a 3%, 4%, whatever the number is rolled back, then we'll look at CAP funding as to whether or not it's fair for them to actually do a 4 or 5% rollback. Now, I'm not saying that to say that every particular level of government will equally share a percentage of a rollback. I, I won't say that right. because some governments can't do that. I mean, they haven't had the growth, first of all, right. uh, to do that. Some, some of our agencies can probably take a 3 4% impact. Others probably couldn't. But we'll look at the cap as well as the, all the other services we have to fund, including our constitutional officers, uh, if the January 29th Constitutional Amendment passes. Mr. Chair, the, uh, the commission this year broke ground on the new uh, barracks style facility at, at the jail. And I know that uh, the jail and jail alternatives has been a major focus of, of this commission for quite a while. Um, part of that discussion now includes the concept of a community change center. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the community change center concept is one where you have to begin to start look at other alternatives that's evidence-based that the court system will use to provide sanctions to people who constantly go in and out of the system. And it has to have several components. It has to have a component that would allow us to have a form of treatment 
for many of the defendants who find themselves going back through the department of the jail who have substance abuse problems. So if we can't get the individuals the help to begin to start identifying and, and dealing with the problem, which is the substance abuse, it doesn't matter what we do, it doesn't matter what sanctions the court imposes on them, they're gonna find themselves back to the jail. And it's costing taxpayers on average about $65 per day to house a person in the jail uh, every day. So if we can have a facility uh, that's somewhat secure, that we can begin to start allowing the court to use as a place to sanction them to, so we can begin to start helping them to get treatment for substance abuses, as well as to begin to start dealing with them in terms of employability skills and those things and make a, a part of the program that they have to not only do the GED and those types of things, but they have to also seek employment, then gain, get gainful employment, while at the same time going through the substance abuse problem, we can begin to start addressing the issue of recidivism, especially when we can deal with the high rate of people going in and out of the court system on violation of probation, mainly for substance abuse problems. We're not talking about people who are committing crimes that are violent, and we're talking about property crimes and those types of crimes where people are using drugs and that's causing them to go out and, and, and commit certain types of offenses. The other component of that is how do we deal with the ever-increasing number of the mentally ill that's in our jail. Uh, jails and prisons throughout the state of Florida have become dumping ground for our mentally ill population. Uh, the county, uh, to its credit, uh, working with uh, uh, Judge Lott and others, and, and through many people in the Maywe group and others, we're working to find ways to divert the mentally ill from the jail. Uh, Sheriff Darnell also needs an, some space at the jail that would allow her to be able to house the most violent uh, people who have mental illness diagnosis. Uh, her staff is not trained to deal with the mentally ill at the jail. However, we must be able to provide secure, safe space, not only for the defendants, but for staff at the jail as well. So there is a need for us to be able to have that type of housing as well. Now, whether or not it could be a part of the Community Change Center, I'm not real sure yet, but we do know that it's a problem, and, and we all recognize uh, that it's a problem. Uh, we, were, we just applied for a million dollar grant through uh, the Mental Health Corporation, uh, which is very competitive, and the county has committed $300,000 over the next several years if we should get the grant, so we can begin to start having programs and those types of things to be able to address this need. Um, if we don't address this problem of the mentally ill in our jails throughout the state of Florida, we will begin to be where we were back in the 60s when jails became institutions. So I think we're, we're progressing in, in that area. Uh, I'll be visiting um, with Chief Judge Steve Leifman, who's appointed by the state Supreme Court Chief Judge to look at this issue around the state. I'll be visiting with him in Miami in, in February as well. Uh, looking at the programs that they're doing there so we can begin to start emulate some of those creative programs here. But we've been very, very creative here in Alachua County. We have mental health court and we have different types of programs that we've been very, very successful and we have a partnership here that we put under the county commission and we brought all the stakeholders uh, to the table. So we're doing a very good job here, but I think we can do more. Now you mentioned some of the nonprofits that we partner with through the CAP program and other programs. Uh, is it Meridian, Meridian Healthcare, Healthcare. That, that we contract for a number of these mental health services? Yeah. They've, been a, they've been a real leader in this and, and, and they've been a partner with us, not only with this, but with the homeless issues as well. And uh, they are the experts in this area and they do a good job of putting together uh, evidence-based programs and those types of things. And, and they are one of the partners with the county uh, uh, working with us to try to make sure that we, if once we become successful with the grant that we'll be able to implement and have real deliverable, real measurable outcomes to determine that what we're doing is actually working. Mr. Chair, we, I want to go into capital projects a little bit, and we sort of touched on the jail barracks, which was sort of one part of a uh, comprehensive program to take a look at the needs at the jail. Uh, population control, I know, has been a, a big subject with this commission, and uh, tell us a little bit, I know there's been some good news recently, uh, I'll knock on wood, you always hope you know, that, that things keep going the way they're going, but uh, tell us a little bit about the good news from, from the jail population. Well, um, the trend now is that the population is beginning to come down. For the first time in quite some time, we've been below the 1,000 person population at the jail and it's been hovering around 800 and it goes up, but for the most part, it's been hovering below the 1,000 person mark, which is good news for us. 
Um, and it could be attributed to the fact that some of the programs that we've put in place over the last couple of years are beginning to work. Uh, and I think the court system has been very, very receptive to deal with evidence-based programs that divert people from the jail. For example, instead of having weekenders to report to the jail on Friday, for example, and stay overnight to work, you just report on Friday, you go out and do community service, then you go home. Those kinds of things help us to control the population uh, at the jail. And the other different types of diversion programs that we have at the jail are beginning to work as well. So, but we have to do more of that if we're able to control the population. I believe it's, it's better for us to deal with jail population from this perspective than it is to build a $30 million, $40 million additional pod, which I don't think we'll be able to raise the revenues to do that. And I don't think the citizens in this county will, in, will support any kind of property tax increase or sales tax increase to build a jail barracks. So the, the sheriff, to her credit, and to our judiciary through the JART committee and through the Public Safety Coordinating Council. We've been working collectively in partnerships uh, to try to make sure that we can divert the population at the jail and, and we've been doing a pretty good job of doing that. Well, I know this commission has made major commitments over the years to the court services department in the county and their alternative programs. Uh, speaking of cap capital projects, we, we touched on the jail barracks, uh, but there's also a uh, number of interesting projects coming on, transportation in infrastructure projects, and tell us a little bit about the commitment for long-term financing for these kinds of capital projects that, that the commission has made. Well, the commission this past year um, approved an additional five cents uh, gasoline tax to begin to start dealing with some of our infrastructure needs. I mean, we probably would never have a dedicated funding source to deal with all of our transportation needs, but it, it is certainly our responsibility to try to find revenue streams to be able to deal with those particular types of needs. Uh, to me, the gasoline tax is a tax that's basically based upon users of the system. And that's why when I ran for office in the year 2000, I supported the gasoline tax, albeit we're at the point now where gasoline is probably the highest it's ever been and it's beginning to come back now. Uh, but the point is, if you impact the system, uh, for example, if you live far out and drive an SUV, you should pay more in taxes and gasoline tax because you impact our roads more. I drive an SUV and I live way out, so I should pay higher taxes on that and I should pay more. And I accept that. But I think also we have to find a way to make sure we can continue to maintain our roadway and be able to provide some capacity wherever we possibly can. I think the gasoline tax is the appropriate source to do that. Also, the gasoline tax is a, an appropriate source to be able to provide multimodal types of transportation, and the city of Gainesville is going to use a lot of its share to continue to upgrade the regional transit system, uh, as well as we're going to be dealing with some of the bike ways and some of the other different types of things for the multimodal. Uh, but here again, I think it was the right thing to do. I think people will begin to start seeing some of the things that we've been doing, and, and if you ride around now, you're beginning to see now some of the transportation improvements that we've been doing, and, and I think you'll be seeing more in the, in the coming, coming year. The, this commission has also uh, made the commitment to bond out, I know, right. for, for a number of these projects, and that's to try to catch up on that right. backlog of roads projects. Well, and here again, when you, when you got dedicated revenue sources and you made the commitment to bond uh, against your capacity, you look at doing many projects because it's more feasible to do many projects, bid them all out and get all the work done because you're dealing with one particular contract in most cases and you're dealing with everything at one time in the market so you can get a better rate in terms of the actual interest rate at the bond market. But when you're doing these types of things, it's good for the economy because one, you're putting money back into the economy, you're putting people to work, uh, and with the slow economy that we're having now, it's always important to keep people working, and the money is staying in our community, and I think that's what's most important. Um, shifting gears a little bit, let, let's talk about intergovernment uh, relations and intergovernment projects that are going on. Uh, lots of conversation this year about fire rescue, and I know the, uh, the city of Gainesville is doing a, looks like they're going through with a fire assessment. Uh, tell, tell me what's uh, going on uh, in general with, with fire rescue and that whole conversation. Well, a couple of interesting things. As you mentioned, the city is currently right now looking at whether or not they want to put in place a fire assessment um, in the coming year. Um, the county has decided this year we're going to pass on a fire assessment and we'll probably take it up again next year and we start looking at it. But you have the small cities that are putting together what's called a potential fire district. 
where all of the municipalities will share into a district and will try to determine levels of services and those issues, which will make it better for the county in dealing with a district, which would include all the small cities. Uh, I'm optimistic that that will certainly come about and I'm encouraging uh, that dialogue. Um, I, I think when you look at the overall picture of fire, we still need to get to where we have one system of service delivery. Uh, and if we can ever get the funding source dedicated, then the governance structure will easily, I think, work its way out. A couple of things are making that possible. The city of Gainesville is looking at moving forward with a fire assessment. Uh, we have at least two municipalities that currently have some sort of fire assessment. And if we should create the structure with the small cities and the district governance piece, and if all of them at some point in time in the future should adopt the fire assessment, then what's left is the counties adopting a fire assessment and unincorporated lots with counties. So now you have a dedicated funding source where all of those entities put their monies in a pot, if you will. Then you figure out how best do we govern it? Who runs it? How does it run? I mean, now you're looking at a seamless system of service delivery I think we need to have. And, and to me, um, I think the county does an admirable job in fire service delivery. Uh, but I can, I can go either way, being all under the county, it being all under the city, or being all under the district. I can go either way, whatever way is most efficient and provides the, the, the service that we need to have and, and cost the less for the taxpayers is probably the way that I would probably go. And uh, just as we're kind of going over all this, I'll try to remember which of these have bonded projects. I know one of the projects that the uh, recent bond issue is going to cover is fire the new station. fire station right. in Jonesville. We've been a new fire station in Jonesville. Hopefully that, that will get underway pretty soon. Uh, and it's gonna come online and, and there is truly a need for a new fire service in that particular area that is a high growth area. Uh, philosophically, I, I'm not one who wants to go out and continue to capitalize um, fire stations in areas that are not urban. Uh, because I think it leads to the continual sprawl. Uh, if the area is urban, I first my first step is to see can it be annexed into one of the cities that's in this urban reserve, if it's urban enough. Uh, that's my always my first uh, objective. And if that cannot be realized, then I'm, I'm not one who wants to build a new, because when you build those types of new facilities, then it, it becomes a magnet for growth around it. And then to me, you have leapfrog development, which we're not trying to do under the Boundary Adjustment Act. So I think that's gonna come online, and I think our annexation conversations are gonna be better this year. Uh, I've began a dialogue with the small municipalities every month. I have a meeting with the mayors and elected managers of the cities that I'm doing every month to improve our intergovernmental relations. The first topic on the agenda now is dealing with the Boundary Adjustment Act and how do we deal with enclaves under the Boundary Adjustment Act. I'm, I'm optimistic that working with the, the cities that we can probably come up with a plan that our dele legislative delegation can appreciate and maybe support. And the concept may simply be at some point in time in the future, uh, we will have a date to where all enclaves will become a part of that city. And in doing that, we'll, there will be public hearings prior to that future meeting perhaps to where each government will have a public hearing to discuss enclaves or potential enclaves in their area that at a certain date in the future will come underneath that particular city. And, and for the folks at home, an, an enclave is? An, an enclave is an area to where it's almost encompassed to where the service area is surrounded by a city, if you will, but this, there's a part in there that's a part of an unincorporated city that the county has to provide service to. It's like going in, not necessarily a pocket, it's like going in and provide a service and come out. Well, in theory, it probably would be better served by the municipality that provides the service. So what we're trying to do, and, um, and what the Boundary Adjustment Act requires us to do as a part of, of, of that mechanism is to make sure that we don't create additional enclaves. Now, part of that annexation conversation I know over the last couple of years has been the development with the city of Gainesville of the annexation transition agreement. Uh, how, how is that going? Well, we'll soon find out how well it's going when we have our first major annexation, which is probably going to be the annexation of Butler Plaza coming up sometime this year. Um, I think it has the potential to work well. Uh, the only downside of annexation is that the county is responsible for ensuring that the municipality that's doing the annexing delivers 
what they say they're going to deliver in those urban services report when they go through the annexation process. So the county, if you will, becomes the annexation marshal. That's not a very good position to be in when you have to determine and, and, and ensure that those things happen, but that's the role we have under the law, so we have to serve in that role. It could at times be, be very, very contentious. Uh, but I think the Butler Plaza annexation would be our first real test to see how well that particular document works. And I think we all realize that the document itself is a good beginning, but it hasn't been put to the test. And I think that's going to be our first test. Now, uh, I want to make sure I'm covering the, the different bonding projects. And I know that there are some parks and recreation. Right projects that are included in the bond issue. Can you tell us about that? Well, we're going to be doing something at Jones Park. Uh, it's, it, I guess it all depends on your perspective at Jones Park, but we're going to be working with the people at Jones Park through in a local agreement doing some things there. Uh, we're doing a park on Southeast 35th Street uh, that has been promised for quite some time. we got a partnership doing with that with the private sector with Clark Butler and others. So recreation, if you look at it, we're doing it, but my personal philosophy on recreation is not one that you provide the service, but that you facilitate by either acquiring the land or providing the capital, if you will, and allow the municipality to provide the service. And in exchange for that, allow the residents in unincorporated Lodgeville County to go at that place and receive the service at the same cost or no cost as if a person was in that city. So many of us have, we're all across the board on when it comes to, to, to how we should deal with recreation services. But I'm, I'm, but I'm optimistic by the conversation we've been having of late uh, with the Recreation Coordinating Council and others moving forward with that. And there may be a potential in the future that we'll have a dedicated funding source to, for our recreation improvements. Is that the uh, special district kind of special idea district, that's yeah. floating around? That's the new special district model that was rec uh, been recommended by the Recreation Coordinating Council. Uh, that we consider as being a model. Uh, and I think if there's ever a funding source and if there's ever a model, I think it's one certain that, that this citizen this county will certainly approve. Uh, Mr. Chair, at the last commission meeting, there was the approval or the acceptance of a donation of 115 acres of land, uh, uh, conservation easement, I think was, th was the term. Right. And I guess that's kind of adding to this inventory of, of land that's uh, been acquired by the county in recent years through the Alachua County Forever program. And that, that program seems to have been going like gangbusters of late. Well, I think we've, of the 29 million that I think we were approved for back in 2000, I think we probably almost spent the first issue, I think it was about 14 million. And we've leveraged that to almost where it's 40 some million. And we still have like two or three million or so like that's left. So you can see that uh, Ramesh Butch and the people uh, from the county working with the Nature Conservatory and others have done a great job of doing that. Uh, I'm optimistic that uh, the actual program would meet its goal. But at some point in time in the future, the question is gonna arise, okay, we've been so successful. What do we do in the future? Do we go out for another issue? when and if we issue those final uh, dollars we have available, or do we allow that particular funding source to be a part of the proposed once in sales tax? There have been some discussions with that. But overall, we've been very, very successful with that program, and we have actually preserved and conserved some environmental sense of land, and that was the overall goal of the program when it was approved in 2000 by the voters. Uh, jumping around a little bit, uh, we've got the access program uh, that's coming up in March, and uh, uh, Administrative Services, Kim Baldry, she administers the program with the help of a team from <clears throat> all around the county. And uh, tell us your, your feelings on the Citizens Academy that we do. Well, anyone who wants to get a real flavor and have some time to spend with the county and understand how the county works, it will truly be an eye-opener for them. I've talked to several graduates of the Access Program, and many of them, all of them say, I had no idea of how vast and what the county government does. I guess when you when you sit back and you watch county government from outside in, I mean, many perspectives and perceptions come to one's mind, but when you get the opportunity to visit departments, understand how the process works, understand what this county actually delivers with what we have to deliver them with, you get a different appreciation uh, for county government. And, and I'm always uh, optimistic that we're gonna have people in the program and, and I'm excited about it. And I encourage anyone who wants to get involved with government, that's the entry point. 
that you want to get involved with. If you ever even thinking about running for county government in the future, that is an entry point that you certainly want to go through because you will get a real understanding of how county government actually works. At the uh, recent retreat, uh, the county manager did a uh, presentation on the Aligning for Success program and uh, the vision of that program, I think, is to use the County Commission's guiding vision as the starting off point and to try to make sure that everything is aligned for that. Uh, those programs were recently mentioned in a book uh, that is distributed nationally on performance management. And uh, I know you'd ask me to bring up just the working relationship between you and the county manager and the county attorney and the staff. Well, we have, we have two great staff that work directly for us, the county manager, Randy Reed, and the county attorney, Dave Wagner, and, and their respective staffs. And um, county government staff makes county government, those of us who are elected, look absolutely brilliant. And of times, of course, if people don't like their decisions, it makes it look just the opposite. But for the most part, they make us look exceptionally brilliant. And because we have good dedicated staff, it's important that we try to retain our staff. And oftentimes, we're at loggerheads with the private sector who picks off our great employees and send them into the private sector. Uh, we can't compete with the private sector. Uh, public service is one of those callers you just got to have because you can't make as much money in the public sector as you could if you went to the private sector. So that's why I've always been a person who believes in supporting and taking care of your staff, uh, making sure that we can provide the types of benefits and the, the type of uh, income that we're competitive around the county, especially for counties our size and to make sure that they get the necessary training, that they go to training and always to be able to hone in on their skills because I believe if you don't go, you don't grow. And what I mean by that is if you don't go to seminars and find out what the latest best practices are and those types of things, how can you continue to actually do your job to the best of your ability? So I think the manager and the attorney has done an outstanding job in keeping the best and the brightest minds. But here again, we're always under assault uh, from the private sector coming and picking off our, our employees. So we're happy, uh, and I think it's been somewhat challenging for our staff, especially with the rollback. Uh, they, they're always un, 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 uneasy about what this session brings or what this vote brings. Hopefully we'll get some stability uh, in terms of where we're going and what we're doing, but we're forever moving because the target is not moving from us, it's moving in Tallahassee. But other than that, we, we have a great workforce. Mr. Chair, I know that this commission has also made communication a, uh, a priority. And uh, we try to avoid, and you all have made it very clear, that you want the public involved and informed. And this commission made a uh, commitment to that, a financial commitment to that this last year with, uh, with streaming video. Uh, tell us what that makes available to the community. Well, it, what it does, it allows people to see meetings in real time. Uh, I had the opportunity for the first time I was at a conference, I think, in Phoenix. And I think we were rolling it out then, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And I got the chance to see a meeting live while I was at uh, the National Association of Counties Conference and in real time to be able to see what is going on back home. Uh, so a person now can go anywhere and log on anywhere in the world and be able to not only see a meeting in real time, but can go back and look at any meeting. And whenever you're beginning to do that, you're beginning to, I believe, as we move forward in this age of technology, to be able to provide to people who can't get here, who can't see what you're doing, to be able to do that. And that's all a part of the transparency. Uh, this particular county is always want to make sure that the people who want to be engaged have an opportunity to know when we're going to be engaging and what's going to be on the agenda when we engage. And if they can't attend it, they can always go to the website they can always pull out any minutes. They can always see our agendas. We have an e-agenda, electronic agenda. So we want to make sure that we try to bring the public as long as much as we humanly possibly can. Uh, transparency has always been the theme uh, of this commission. It goes, it dates back to former county commissioner, Penny Wheat, who's a strong advocate of uh, open government and transparency. And we have actually kept that particular ball rolling. So. And thanks to you and your staff, we're moving forward with high tech streaming video and those types of things, and we're, we're constantly moving forward. Another thing that uh, the commission approved in the last year and that has recently made it to the website is the real-time tracking of uh, building permits. Right. <clears throat> and you can now go in and find out exactly where you are in the process. And 
Well, it's important to people in the building community who don't have the time to pick up the phone and call or whatever, they can go online at any point in time and see where there is and when they can pick up permits. That's all about efficiency of services. And I'm always about efficiency of services, and that starts with the things that I'm, I'm responsible for, which is the actual running of meetings. So to me, in, in order to make sure that everybody understands efficiency, it has to start at the top. And for me, efficiency of meetings and making sure the public has a reasonable expectation of what's going to be discussed, getting that information out as soon as we possibly can, making sure that we have all the backup information that we can before a date so the public or anyone else will know what we're going to be discussing. So with that, it's always important to have efficiency in service delivery. You mentioned when we were talking about the access program that people that go through it say, I have no idea. And as a fairly new county employee, I've certainly had an education in uh, what county government provides over the last few years. Going back, though, a step to community support services, um, part of taking care of the homeless in this community and people in general has been our veterans services uh, program. I had no idea when I came here that there was a county organization that was a veteran services office and can you tell us a little bit about Jim Lynch and that oh, office? Jim Lynch and his office I mean he's probably one of the most loved public servants we have in this county I mean when you deal with the people who've given service to our country and people who get lost in the maze if you will when they come back from giving service to this community and those who are veterans uh, Jim has this ability to be able to talk with all of our veterans of all the wars and be able to make sure that they are engaged and that the services that they need. Even if you have to take them hand by hand and walk them through processes, he does that. And that's admirable and commendable. He also makes sure he stays on top of those persons who, who actually lost their lives in, in the line of duty and those things and that the appropriate recognition uh, be given to those families. So that is probably one of the departments that we have over community support services that reaches out. Uh, and one would think it's a federal government program but it is a county program that's run and it's run very, very efficiently. Uh, Mr. Chair, this hour has gone by very quickly. Um, I know that this is a, a year coming up that, that brings a lot of challenges with it. And uh, any last thoughts on the year that you're facing? Well, it's going to be a challenging year, but uh, I and my colleagues were up to the challenge. Um, we're just going to have to make sure that we get through it a little bit at a time. Our first real challenge is going to be in the first month of the year, which is January. And we'll pretty much get an idea of how we move from there. Personally, I may be opposed to the constitutional amendment, but realistically, I'm kind of somewhat hoping that it passes because I, will think, I don't think we'll be ready to deal with what may happen in the legislature if it doesn't pass. So if it passes, it may be that we're through with property tax reform for a while. If it doesn't, then one, we don't have any idea of what may happen in the legislature as we go through the next budget process. But all in all, I think the citizens of the city of, city of Gainesville and the other municipalities and the County, they, they should be proud to know that you have public servants in this county who are committed to trying to do what's right and what's fair for the best for everybody we serve. So I'm just pleased and honored to be able to be one of the ones that serve the citizens of this county. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for having me. to each other a lot. A lot of the notes, they were just really dark. Expressions of anger when he was mad, he hit things. He said something to me about uh, killing himself. You have to take it seriously. The risk is too great. You have to um, try and help them get help. Tell somebody, tell an adult, counselor, parent, whatever. What are you going to do? Let them destroy themselves? I, mean, I don't see much of a choice at all. Joey's landscaping business keeps growing. His crew needs to stay healthy to keep working strong. Finding out about choices has kept his employees happy and loyal and the business blossoming. Alachua County's Choices, healthcare for the working uninsured.
To find out if you qualify for choices, call 352-264-6772 or visit us online at www.acchoices.com. It was going to be the house of my dreams, but something went wrong. It was the opportunity I've been dreaming of, but suddenly it was gone. I dreamed of the day all barriers would be gone, but they're still there. I'm Ida Rawls. If discrimination is turning your dream into a nightmare, we can help. The Alachua County Equal Opportunity Division wants to make sure every citizen has the opportunity to follow their dreams. If you are a victim of discrimination based on any of these categories, we can help.